For some background, I'm an engineer. I work on the open source project Key Native. This project has a bunch of subgroups, uh, which I'll kind of get into, but I'm the lead for the serving. I'm also on the steering committee. Um, we had a TOC, but we merged it. We simplified our governance a little bit. You can see my different handles. I signed up for Blue Sky yesterday. You can be my first follower. So, a <laughs> uh, quick overview of Key Native. Um, there's a bunch of subgroups with it, but um, serving is sort of the one I'm involved in, and it kind of does auto scaling your workloads uh, to zero. I'll cover a little bit more. Then you have eventing. That lets you um, kind of wire sources to these workloads, and you don't need to use Knative Serving. You can wire them up to uh, deployments and things like that. And we have a bunch of sources. Think of like some pub sub stuff, et cetera, um, that can you react on. We have a CLI group, um, so you can interact everything using a CLI. And then we also have this uh, functions subgroup. And, what they try to do is just provide like a functional uh, programming model that then runs on top of serving. But you can use all these things together and build like a FAS, but you can use things separately. So if I want to build functions and then run them on just anything I want, I can do that because it just builds containers. Um, if you just want to have a serving and not eventing, you can. So we kind of call it like a Voltron project where you can use all these things independently, but if you use it together, you get some cool capabilities kind of like a platform. Uh, so serving in a little bit more detail, you kind of offer a higher level of abstraction of Kubernetes. Essentially, we do all this network programming. Um, we do revision management and things like that. But essentially, what you're doing is you're taking a container, an image, and then you'll get like a URL back that has uh, certificates provisioned, things like that. And we can do traffic spinning, and we do things like these automatic health checks. So here's kind of like an example. Um, this is, we named it, it's called service, but it's actually a key native service. So I'll just call it uh, key service just to not confuse people. This is kind of like all you need to define. So in my service, I have a template spec. You can see uh, my image has like some function. I can specify a container port. I'm kind of highlighting like you can do traffic spinning, but if you don't specify anything in that traffic block, it'll just always route to the latest revision. And you can kind of see a def down there, um, hey, once I deploy this service, and if the operator is configured, automatic cert provisioning, I'll get back like a full URL in my status and things like that. So this is kind of what I was highlighting with the uh, high level abstraction. If you wanted to do this with all these open source components on Kubernetes, you're writing, you need a horizontal pod auto scaler, you need a deployment, you create a Kubernetes service, then you gotta create an ingress, then you gotta create some other thing and some other thing. And it's just a lot of complexity for people um, to manage. A lot of people try to manage this complexity using templating and things like that. It works, but um, how do you know when one thing's failed, um, like if your deployment fails, how, how does that bubble up, those type of errors? Um, and I kinda wanna dig into our object model. So I kinda mentioned this is the key native service. What we do is it kind of creates a configuration, and what that ends up doing is recording histories of changes, kind of like that. And then you end up having a route, and then that route will end up uh, routing, you get to choose to route to revisions and things like that. So you kind of have like a linear history of, of the changes that you've made. Um, and then back, so I guess I should have made the date larger. Back in Q1 of 2018, the uh, networking stack depended on Istio only. And then uh, three quarters later in that same year, we added an abstraction that then allowed the networking to be pluggable. So right now we have like Contour, Istio, Courier. Uh, back then we also had Glue and Ambassador, but I think those integrations just kind of staled out. Um, but my big point here is when I talked to someone, I think two days ago, they're like, oh, it still depends on Istio, right? I'm like, no, it hasn't depended on Istio, and it's like something I have to keep saying every year. Uh, maybe for the next coupon talk, I'll just have one talk where I just repeat the same thing for a full hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> and what, we're, what we started, I think, two years ago is for now we're actually reconciling the Gateway API. So we kind of started with the Alpha APIs, and then we went through some revisions, but now that it's sort of like Gateway API is V1 as of last November, um, we're putting a bit more emphasis on that. So 
then I'm going to kind of cover what we've been up to there. Um, in the future, the ideal would be, hey, we get rid of all this complexity, and then we just program the gateway API. Um, I don't know when that will be, but that will, that's our ultimate goal. It will just simplify a lot of things. Um, so what have we learned? Well, kind of like from my title, I want to cover, what, what do I mean by ready? Um, so going back to our service that we made, this is essentially like the minimal YAML that you need to deploy it. Um, when you deploy something, you get back, uh, we reconcile, we provide statuses. And usually in those statuses, um, you kind of provide information about specific things. So we provide information about the configuration, the route. Um, the problem with this is that as a client or a consumer, I have to know what the statuses mean. I need to know the names. Like, how many of you have de deployed a deployment and then try to figure out what status it's at? Like, what do you usually look for? Anyone? I see one way at the back. Okay, I was, I'll answer the question. You don't know, right? Like, you, like progress deadline, It's if it's fail, you're trying to figure out the reasoning, what's happening. It's kind of confusing, and then if you add a new condition uh, or change conditions or change the name, then it kind of, your client is bound to these conditions. So one thing Knative does, we add like a top level ready condition on all our statuses. And then that's kind of simpler for clients to reason about like, hey, is my route ready? I just go and see the ready condition. Is my um, revision ready? Has it scaled properly? I go look at the ready condition and things like that. And then the way it kind of works is, hey, if the revision's ready, we just kind of bubble up the status. So we get config ready, route ready, service ready, et cetera. Um, now I'm kind of segueing, what does it mean for the route to be ready? Um, well, kind of like I showed before, since we reconcile down to uh, the different implementations, really, we kind of push the problem down, right? Push it down to this, our ingress abstraction, then we push it down to the actual implementation. And then what does it mean for those, for an Istio virtual service to be ready? What does it mean for HP proxy to be ready? And this is where, like, these are the types of guarantees some of these implementations provide. So, for example, two that are here are, it validates the configuration, and then um, it also kind of gives you a signal when it sends the config to a proxy. And then the question I have, do you think that um, these guarantees make it safe for the client to make a request? without dropping traffic? And yes or no? Who thinks, or raise your hand if you think it's safe? Nobody, <laughs> okay, <laughs> one person. Well, they're not safe. Essentially, what happens is, just because like uh, the controller says the uh, config is valid and marks something on the status, that doesn't give you an indication that uh, it actually has propagated the, the proxy that the proxy has actually actuated, let's say like you added a new listener on a new port, let's turn on the port, um, and so forth like that. So another guarantee could be, um, hey, we want the config once it gets to the proxy to send the uh, act back. But then, even then, it doesn't give you a good guarantee, uh, simply because you, uh, it might receive the message, but then the proxy needs to do some machinery to actually actuate on it, to actually like spin up a new listener and things like that. Okay, so then what if we add, for example, uh, proxies wait, they do the work, then they give back a, a acknowledgement backwards, and it could be async or something like that. Who many people think that guarantee uh, makes it safe to make a request as a client once you get that back? No one? <laughs> Yes or no? Raise your hand if you think it's safe. Okay, well, I guess everyone knows. Uh, I'm saying it's not safe because you forgot about DNS. You didn't program your DNS, so you don't know about that. And then subsequently, what if you have more than one proxy? Um, you actually need to have your controller aggregate the status of all the proxies um, and to know that it's that. This is kind of where we segue to the Gateway API then. Like, what conditions does the Gateway API provide on their routes? Um, and what's standard and core right now is two. So one is accepted, which kind of maps then to the guarantee I had that your configuration is valid. And the other one is programmed, which kind of just means that your uh, configuration was sent off to 
the proxies that it's programming. And kind of as we went through the exercise, I don't really consider that any, not a safe guarantee for a client to know that it's, it'll make a successful request. Um, something else to call out is, as we've written these integrations with all these different proxies, there are various quirks where um, some gateway implementations have a status block. They sometimes have some sort of like readiness condition, but then, for example, if you're familiar with generation on resources and then observe generation, you're supposed to match up um, whether the spec and the generation on the status match up, then you know it's actually been changed. Um, a lot of implementations don't even bump that number, so and, like it doesn't really mean anything to change the spec and things like that. Um, but kind of this is my long-winded way of saying like, hey, there's no reliable way for clients to know when it's safe to make a request when you program your route or apply it. Um, this is where I can use your help. Um, so in the Gateway API now, they've reserved a ready condition, but they haven't decided what to do with it. Um, so what I would like people to do is visit this link <laughs> and this thing, and then um, as part of Gateway 1.3, they're going through a scoping phase, and I'm trying to just poke them to say that, like, hey, if, do you care about this stuff? Am I the only crazy one with a tin hat that cares about this stuff? So you can just go to this GitHub issue and just add some likes to it and then help. Uh, so given, uh, given the problem, oh god, it's like, what do we do? This is how I feel every day. Um, I, I, feel, I feel really, it's not, it's not glamorous at all. It's, it's just, when I found out this is what we're doing, I'm like, it's, it's, it's very sad, but it's just like, yes, we probe. Like, we probe the proxies to see if the route has programmed. Um, not very elaborate, not very smart, but guess what, it works. And it will work with any proxy you have. <laughs> but how do we do it in Knative specifically? Well, ideally we'd have our Knative ingress object that we kind of then turn into a gateway HTTP route. Um, I guess I didn't clarify that key native ingress object is kind of like an internal type that we use. Um, ideally, we would just have like, hey, this is my host name, this is my backend. Um, but in order to do the probing, we actually do a hash of our ingress and we add a bunch of filters and use some special headers to say, as we, when we do a probe, we use a special header and then um, that request header modifier will then add, essentially, um, when the request goes through the proxy, the special hash, and then we have workloads that have special sidecars that then will return that hash, and then that way we know uh, when the route has been sort of programmed. Um, this is kind of like the high level, where it's like, hey, we'll make the route controller, it programs the proxy, and then for each host, we do a bunch of probes. Um, that hits our Knative pod, and then it responds with the hash back. When we see that the hashes match up, um, then we know that the route is ready, and then we essentially then end up marking uh, these implementations as ready, then we can eventually mark the route as ready, right? So problem solved, right? <laughs> so this is the other interesting bit. It's like, that, let's say that's for just creating routes. What about sort of updates? So Let's say I have my backend here on my HP route, and I specify it's going to some uh, function, and then I want to change it to my other backend, and while I'm doing that, I'm doing consistent probing, right? Who thinks that that is safe? Can you raise your hand? I guess no. <laughs> Everyone's learned their lesson. <laughs> no, it's not safe. If everyone wonders where this is from, it's a movie called Marathon Man. I haven't seen it, but the, when I Google, is it safe, this is what comes up. It, lo it looks like a very good movie. It has Lawrence Olivier in it. OK, so essentially, updates are also not safe. There's a few things you need to worry about. Um, and it's actually very implementation specific and how the ingress tries to either try to be smart and optimize some things. Uh, let's say you optimize memory usage. Um, and then you don't end up tracking all the services in your cluster, all the endpoints in your cluster, you're just tracking things that are referenced. That kind of means then, I'll kind of do an illustration. So if I have a route, let's say it's referencing A, and that service points to pod A, um, 
in the proxy, and this being the Envoy specific, pro the Envoy will have sort of like this route map of like routes to backends. But then also you have sort of this, each backend has then a list of like endpoints that it has. Um, so this is kind of an example where we're doing the client request. Then if we, let's say, shift over our route to the next backend, what can happen is, um, Oh, I guess in this example, if I go really fast, what you see is, hey, the service backends got updated. This is one kind of race that can happen, but the route map wasn't updated. Uh, hold on. Okay, so in the route map, it points to A still when the requests are coming. Uh, because it's not referencing A anymore, that cluster or in Envoy terms got pruned. Um, and then, so essentially, the route map points to nothing. So then requests fail. The other alternative is, um, hey, the route map get updated, but there's a delay on getting the endpoints into the uh, clusters, or not cluster, but the service X backend. So at this point, then the route's fine, but there's no backends to route to, then you also get like a 500. Um, so really what you need, ideally, is to have them both updated at the same time atomically, and then depending on your implementation, that doesn't happen. Like Envoy has two distinct APIs for routing and endpoints. Um, I don't, I haven't used Linkerd because they don't do ingress stuff, but I don't know what they do. Um, so really what, <laughs> to avoid this, like proxies should, uh, well it's a trade off really. You need to track all your backends. Um, so for example, even though this route only points to service X, it's also tracking the backends for service A. I think most implementations just do that. Um, and then another instance where things can fail, this one's very easy to avoid, you just kind of, um, this is kind of, uh, you just need to wait. So for example, if I create a service and a new pod and move the route over right away, then that service might not have a ready endpoint. Um, so ideally you deploy your service, wait for a ready endpoint, then you switch over your routing, and that's usually a safe way of doing that. Um, so given these problems, how does Knative get around it? Um, so it's another, what do we do? Let me see the time, okay. I'm gonna give a shout out to Matt Moore. Uh, he was a contributor on Knative back in the day, now he's a uh, CTO of ChainGuard. So he spent, I don't know how many months banging on this problem, um, trying to solve it for Contour, um, and we came up with the solution. And I'm gonna describe how I took that solution and adopted it for the Gateway API. Um, but essentially, we have to do, unfortunately, a three-phase update. So if I want to move my route to service X safely, we end up um, first adding, essentially, a new backend, and then we specifically have those backends be like, um, like a probing point. So in the Contour hack, it was essentially like a new invalid host name that no one will ever reference in the cluster. That confuses users when you see, like, hey, what's this random thing that gets created temporarily? So at least for the gateway, because we have, um, what is it, path matching? I could do like well-known paths and so forth like that. I think I'll cover it in the thing. So what happens then is, hey, we end up getting a bunch of new probing routes, and then eventually we'll have the service uh, show up in the, uh, the proxy, and eventually the endpoint will be populated. And then once that's done, we can safely move the main route to let's say service X, but we still keep the old probes because even dropping the old ones now can cause some issues if there's uh, flight uh, request in flight and things like that. And eventually we then drop the extra probes and then things get, uh, sorry, and then things kind of get cleaned up ideally. Um, that's especially if they do pruning. So we do, that, that's kind of like the hack. So we probe and then we do very slow updates in a safe manner to get around this problem. This is what Kenya kind of does automatically. Ideally, like a ready condition would do this for us, but it really is implementation dependent. Um, so kind of the summary is like, if a proxy tracks a subset of the services, then updates potentially aren't safe. Um, and if you do deploy a new service and switch over the route really quickly, you should really wait for that pod to be ready and also the endpoint to be ready in the uh, Kubernetes services endpoint slice. 
And even then, you need to wait for the endpoint slice IP to be detected by the proxy and control plane and all that stuff. So there's just a delay that happens. Um, and that, one thing I think that could be interesting to know is like showing you some real metrics about this stuff. So this was actually a fun thing to do. So the test is fairly simple. There's two of them. I did, there's a creation and update one. Um, this first test just creates a service and a pod, waits for the endpoint to have a ready address, since she's skipping that uh, second failure that I was mentioning. Creates a new route with a domain. Uh, we pull to see how long it takes to get ready, and then we do this a thousand times. And the results are pretty interesting. So here's, um, you can see traffic in blue. Even, I don't really understand how that works, because it's very sporadic, but at least it's flat, um, so that you can maybe say that there's a floor. Uh, someone suggested to me that there's, maybe they do things on a timing pole, a loop, so maybe that's why you have that. But you can kind of see with like um, a thousand services, contour kind of linearly grows up, but it's still fine where it's just like under three seconds. Um, you can see uh, yellow is Envoy Gateway, kind of has a very similar trajectory as contour, but it's still around like a second. That's essentially the delay from when I create my route to how long it's actually ready if I'm probing. And then, at least in this graph, um, Istio performs pretty well. Like it's, uh, the slope is the lowest, right? Uh, for updating, this is kind of the test that we did. I create an initial service in iPod. I create a single HP route and start polling. And then kind of what we're doing is we're updating backends. So I'll create a new service, new pod, update the backend and see how long it takes. And then I run that a uh, hundred times. And then we just check the polar to see if there's any drop traffic. Uh, the results are interesting. So updates are very fast for pretty much everybody. Traffic again, it's all over the place, but it's, all, it's still under one, one and a half seconds. Um, but you can see Envoy Gateway and Contour at the bottom. Istio, I believe, is green. This is where I kind of screwed up the slides. I should have used the same colors <laughs> between them. <laughs> um, it's funny, talking to an Istio maintainer, uh, the reason why they're at like 100 milliseconds is that they purposely wait 100 millisecond intervals to send out um, config changes out to the proxy. So it's actually funny to see that in uh, data. And then down here, you can see the results of the probing as part of the update. So like traffic, Envoy, Gateway, and Istio all had, did drop no traffic. Contour, 99.62, so there's a, Again, that's that bit of traffic drop without the guarantees of the probing change and things like that. Um, I gotta call out, <laughs> I feel bad, but like, I gotta call out GKE Managed Gateways. Um, for those who aren't aware, GKE has global load balancers that you can, um, when you spin up a GKE cluster, you say you support Gateway API, and then you have the ability to program a bunch of global load balancers that they have. So they have, I don't really know what the names are anymore. Um, I did this a week ago, but I think the first one is a regional load balancer, and what's interesting is when you create an HP route and then you start probing it, it will take a minute and 30 seconds for that route to be ready on create, which to me is like forever. I'm assuming, which I don't know, someone can disprove me, that it must be programming the whole world, and that's how long it takes. So maybe a minute, 30 seconds isn't bad for I don't know how many servers. Uh, ready update, kind of similar, a minute and 40 seconds. But what's really unfortunate is like part of the updating, the SLI goes to 64%. So you're dropping um, over a third of your traffic on ready updates, which to me is a bit surprising. I tried also doing it with this L7 global load balancer, but um, the creation times were the same, but for some reason updates took over two minutes and timed out for me because I didn't want to wait that long, <laughs> so uh, it never succeeded under two minutes for the updates there. Um, and there's other more interesting quirks. So let's say I don't use a managed load balancer and then I do um, an in-cluster gateway. Well, technically, an in-cluster gateway will eventually be backed potentially by a service load balancer type. Um, and in this example, what I'm doing is I'm adding a listener here. So, hey, I have port 80. I want to add a new metrics port, so I'm modifying uh, my gateway. What that kind of will imply is the gateway will then need to do an update to the service type load balancer. That will need to update your infrastructure's load balancer, AWS or GKE. 
Um, but then what's interesting is, again, I feel bad, on GKE, whenever you add a new listener, um, if you're sending continuous traffic to port 80, it'll stop serving traffic on port 80. Um, so the continuous traffic stops working. So there's another bitly link that um, essentially I was being gaslit by Google support when I submitted this. So they're like, hey, I made this a public issue for the, on their issue tracker. So, and they need upvotes for them to fix it. So if people just go to that bitly link, Google fix my LB. Uh, here's a big giant QR code if you want to also fix it. It's got like 10 votes now. I just need like a few hundred and then they'll get to it and that, that um, person will get a nice sweet promotion, whoever does it. This is how I feel right now, you know? <laughs> also, Caroline Rose is a great uh, performer, so. So how do you get around uh, these weird quirks? Well, Google support will say like, well, you should create this type of load balancer. I'm like, okay, well, how do you do that if I'm creating things through the gateway API? There's an infrastructure stanza. Um, you can add labels and annotations. Those, in theory, should propagate down to the actual service that um, the gateway is creating. Um, and then kind of moving on to just kind of like random stuff now. Um, uh, your HTTP route can point to different backends, but those backends could also support different protocols. So gRPC is technically HTTP2, so in theory you could route HP, an HTTP route to a gRPC workload if it's uh, HTTP prior knowledge. So how do you do that? Well, on the service you have this app protocol and you just gotta set it right now. Uh, I added some conformance tests, so it does tests for WebSockets and H2 prior knowledge. And then some things that are coming is, um, kind of throwing this out there, merging listeners. So kind of one problem Key Native has, and let me kind of get into it, is in this gateway example, I have a port on port 80, that's my regular traffic, and then I have my secure traffic on, uh, I think I put it on port 443. You can see I added a host name, I have a certificate, um, but Knative, it does automatic TLS provisioning. Um, and what we do is we delegate a cert manager to do all this work, and the most popular type of auto-provisioning cert challenges through cert manager is HP01, and what that means, it doesn't support um, wildcards. So then we end up with this scenario where um, if we wanted to add a new workload with a, its own unique cert, you have to go to the gateway, update that gateway, um, and then essentially you see like kind of the repetition here, which is fine. So I have my foo workload, my bar workload, and they have distinct certs. Um, kind of the challenge with this, it makes the gateway a single point of contention. And then also you only have then a max items of 64. This is a conscious decision by the gateway API to limit the, I guess the impact on the gateway whenever you make changes. And also I think etcd has limits on how big resources can be. Um, so one thing that's I'm kind of pushing for and ideally is a way to uh, kind of separate listeners from the gateways or at least kind of have this app operator persona that like an app operator has a certificate for a workload that's different from the provisioning of the gateway and the infrastructure. Um, so if people are interested and have, if this is a problem that they also have, I wouldn't mind like having people review this and chime in and so forth like that. Um, this is on the gateway repo. So open issue and in discussion, and there's gonna be a maintainer talk about this. Uh, I think it was today, but I got moved to tomorrow. So this is in flight. Um, and yeah, I think that is it. So thanks everyone. And then you got five minutes and 45 seconds for questions. Does anyone have a five minute and 45 second question to ask? Uh, you can use the mic. I think there's mics over there. I see two mics. You have to get up, but they're, they're on like stationary, it looks like. Yeah, I wonder if you have run into um, any issues utilizing the gateway in that right, providing a higher level abstraction makes you lose control of the features provided by the actual implementation. 
right, for instance, we use Envoy a lot, yeah. and right, Envoy definitely has a very rich feature set, a lot of which are not reflected in the Gateway API. So I wonder if you had, uh, you know. Yeah, so I think um, I, I'm not a Gateway authority, but essentially what will happen is um, through each release, there's like a scoping phase. And um, so people propose ideas. So if you, let's say right now for 1.3 for Gateway, go to where the GitHub discussion is happening, propose a feature. Um, and if there's uh, likes and interest in it, and also there's a weighting happening in terms of like complexity versus does this hit average 80% of users or is this a niche thing, um, then that's how kind of things get prioritized. And in the short run, uh, sorry? Oh, he, Nick, Nick, a gateway maintainer here, is asking what feature you're kind of curious about. Uh, mostly is, uh, for instance, we program Envoy in such a way we provide our own uh, filters that, right, that's statically compiled linked yeah. to Envoy. Yeah, so I think it comes down to like, um, ideally, f the way I think things surface in gateway is you might go use the Envoy gateway resources like um, separately that might provide that functionality. And then once there's a use case and then a need and s someone's kind of proven out how it could be done, then it's sort of proposed to become uh, an extended feature or experimental feature. Um, then that could get like one or two more implementations. Once those have baked for, I think, a few releases, then it can get promoted into uh, maybe not like core, but maybe like as an extended feature that supports. And really all it offers is sort of just like, hey, this API will work with multiple implementations. So that's kind of like how the process has been so far on the Gateway API project. All right, yeah, definitely. Thank cool. you. Cool. Yeah, you can talk to Nick, and then there'll be Gateway API updates that might cover that, right? All right, we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Hello. Hello. Um, so uh, as a context, um, I'm kind of a little bit new to learning everything. Sorry, I, I can't. I can't hear no. you. No. Not the mics on. Hello. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I got to talk real deep. <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit new to the Gateway API, by the way, so sorry if I ask a little novice questions. Um, there were very interesting challenges you overcome. Do you feel like the set of challenges that your team specifically had to overcome when moving to the Gateway API are, are going to be pretty common for like anyone else, any other company trying to do the same? Um, I think it depends how much investment you put into it. I think. If you're very, like, this is why I like Knative, I think it's just like a simple abstraction that is like on the cluster that will provide sort of like some extra security and guarantees. In addition to like scaling to zero, it'll do um, like buffering of requests while like things are provisioning. Um, for the gateway thing though, I would, I would say ideally you have more process involved with updates. For example, if you use like CI, CD uh, tooling like and using metrics to know um, uh, when to roll, roll over and cut over traffic, um, I would recommend using tools like that. If you want something to work across like, le like a fleet of clusters or, or things like that. So, so do you feel like uh, Gateway API implementation currently requires more tooling than Ingress? Uh, they're different feature sets. I would say like Gateway API I would use today as is. I, Ingress doesn't do, does very little. And it's all like extensions with, um, sorry, it, it's all extensions with annotations. Mm -hmm. And that's a big challenge because you don't get feedback on your, if your config is valid or not. So at least I would say, yes, use Gateway API v1 and then it's over Ingress in the, today. Um, and then if you need features, then you should engage with the Gateway API community to like um, create an issue and like figure out what the process is. And like again, hey, there's scoping happening for v1.3, uh, and it'd be great if end users got involved there as well. Thank you. Cool. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>